Okay, so um, skipping the slides, pathway and network analysis. So what we're gonna cover today, it's an uh, introduction to pathway network analysis, sources of pathway network, enrichment test, which is running behind the pathway analysis, and I'm gonna show you a very small and very cute example how to do large-scale cancer genomic data analysis. Okay, let's go. So the first question is, why do we need a pathway analysis? Any ideas? So the thing, first thing is, pathway analysis helps us to reduce data from hundreds of genes that you're getting from your screenings, or thousands of genes sometimes, to a very handy number of the passwords. And that helps you to increase the statistical power of your test. The second reason is genes or proteins are very rare operates on its own. It always operates in groups, in pathways, in connections. So if one gene is mutated in one patient and its neighbor is mutated in the second patient, the outcome could be the same. So that helps us to find the meaning of the long tail of rare cancer mutations. You probably all know that. In cancer, in particular type of cancer, only a very small number of genes that mutated at a high rate, like P53 or KRAS and pancreatic cancer. The majority of genes, they just mutated at a very low rate, like 3% of population, or 5% of population. So it's just, we call it long tail. So using the pathway analysis, or even better, network analysis, we can make sense out of those low level mutation rates. And uh, it helps us to generate biologically meaningful hypotheses. Like it's significantly easier to generate a hypothesis based on the EGFR signaling pathway than uh, zinc finger 418 gene that is upregulated in your whatever SHA RNA screening. Yes. So there are three different reasons why do we need many more, but that's what I come up with. So what do we need from pathway analysis? Three different things. The first one, it's a biological question and hypothesis that you probably have. This thing is optional, but helpful. The second one is the list of altered genes or proteins that you got from your FSA. And the last one is a source of pathways or network that could be publicly, that's good, commercially, also not bad, available. Let's start from the first thing. So biological question or hypothesis, as I said, it's optional, but it's always good to keep in mind that helps. So if you're, before you're starting your whatever screening, based on the literature, based on the publication, based on your previous experience, based on the suggestion from the supervisor, you can say, okay, I might expect that P53 signaling is activated after I'm treating my cell lines with the, this particular drug. Yeah? In this case, you need to test basically on one hypothesis. You don't need to run enrichment test across all pathways that could be like thousands of those. You just have one hypothesis, yes? So why do we need a biological hypothesis? Or what kind of biological hypothesis? So hopefully it's a part of your experimental plan. You might want to summarize biological process or other aspects of the gene function. Or if you're doing any kind of different the expression profiling, so what pathways are different between samples uh, with mutation, without mutations, or treated and non-treated cell lines, you might want to find any kind of controller of the process. Uh, for example, if there are so many genes are upregulated, it's probably any kind of transcriptional factor, or TF state for transcriptional factor is actually responsible for this process. You might want to discover new gene function or even a new pathway, who knows? And then you can send an email to a reactor and say, hey, guys, I have a new pathway, let's, let's uh, create it. Or it's a little bit more advanced and also covered in our big workshops, uh, find a correlation with the disease or clinical data attributes. So where the gene list, it's the second component of our enrichment test, comes from. 
The first one is pretty obvious and straightforward. It's your screening assay, sequencing, RNA-seq, DNA-seq, whatever. The second one, as uh, Vincent just showed you, it could be a set of genes from the public data portals like ICGC, OTCGA, or COSMIC. Like, for example, genes uh, with uh, high impact mutations in breast cancer, women uh, with uh, recurrent disease. Fine. And the last one, the gene list that you are manually are automated, curated from the literature. Like, for example, you have a rare cancer, and it's only so many publications that published on this subject. You went through all publications, and you collected all genes that were mentioned in those publications. There's nothing wrong with that. And you can go to the pathway uh, portal and run your enrichment analysis and discover that any kind of pathway is enriched in these genes. That's also fine. So the next point of the presentation is where we're actually getting those pathways and networks. So I'm going to stop briefly on uh, gene ontology, pathway databases, and network databases. So gene, ont gene ontology. So what is ontology in general? It's a basically a concept, a data model that represents knowledge as a set of concepts. Like, for example, what is berry? Berry, it's a strawberry, blueberry, raspberry, da 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 da. But besides that, berry is also food. Besides that, berry is also plants, and so on. So, using this concept, we can create a very huge network or hierarchical hierarchical structure of all these concepts. And the same thing was going on with gene ontology, only uh, they're trying to create a structure of these biological phrases or terms like protein kinases, apoptosis, membranes, and so on. So it's all available in this www.geneontology.org website. Gene ontology website is not static, it's constantly updated. And uh, Gene Ontology Consortium Group has a lot of very ambitious targets, and one of those is to synchronize all these biological terms across different species, at least major species. And uh, Gene Ontology is uh, publicly available, freely available, and you can download any terms, any descriptions uh, free. So, what gene ontology is covering? There are three different components. It's a cell component, it's basically, what is it? Where your reaction or something is happening, molecular function, something like ligand interacting with the receptor or something basic like this, and the biological processes like cell division, apoptosis, and so on. Like, from my experience, uh, the last one is the most useful in cancer research. And just a couple of words of the geo structure. So uh, it has a very complicated structure. So gene ontology is basically the root of this structure. Then we have a biological processes. Is one of those, sorry, that is located here. And then cellular process is a one of the children of the biological process. Cellular physiological process is one of the children of the cellular process, and so on. So finally, we have the B cell apoptosis. That's probably the smallest child that is a child of the apoptosis, and apoptosis of the child of the program cell death. So it could be a gene that belongs to the program cell death, but not to the apoptosis. So you know, it's it's very complicated, but. At, at your stage, it's uh, good to know that uh, uh, every case is also described by a set of genes, and that's how you're running your enrichment test. The second point is the pathway databases. So what are the advantages of the pathway databases? Usually they are curated, especially reactome. We have a very nice... Uh, biological view of the biological, or biochemical view of the biological processes. So the cause and the effect are captured very well. I'm going to show you one of the examples. 
And we have a nice uh, jolly cartoons that presenting the, the, those interactions. But there are also disadvantages. The first one is the sparse coverage of the genome, and it's your fault. Because everybody want to work on P53 signaling. Nobody want to work on zinc finger as 314. And of course, in the first case, it's easier to publish a paper and get a funding than with the second one. That's why zinc finger can never come up on a pathway analysis, but P53 there is probably 20% of pathways. And the second one, it's also, it's, it's in this case our fault, yeah. The different databases disagree on boundaries of the pathways. So if you're downloading P53 signaling from the CAT, Reactome, Panther, and some others, they will be all different. So they're all overlapping on P53, yeah. But so there are a lot of disagree, um, discrepancy, let's say. So just an uh, introduction to a reactum. Reactome is based in OICR, and we have a group of people who are taking care, not only OICR, but one of the hubs in, is OICR. So reactum contains only hand-curated pathways. And we have a very rigorous curation standards. Every reaction in reactum is actually traceable to the primary literature. As October of 2015, there were almost 2,000 human pathways and covering almost 9,000 proteins. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So we are far, far away from the covering the whole genome. And the reactum has an open access, free. In uh, comparison, for example, to CAG, that is several years ago went commercial. So what is the structure of the reactum? So I picked randomly those G1 as DNA damage checkpoint pathway. On the left side of the uh, pathway viewer, you have a hierarchical representation of the pathways. So what we have here at the, at the very top, it's a cell cycle, then cell cycle checkpoint, and then this G1 as DNA damage checkpoint. So if you click on the third line, you'll see a very nice viewer of the pathway. It's basically this kind of viewer was transported later on in ICGC, and Vincent showed you one of the examples. So um, it's a very rich representation on what's going on in those G1 as DNA damage checkpoint. So the green ones, it's uh, proteins or uh, post-translational modification, modifi modified proteins, and the blue ones, it's uh, protein complexes. We have some molecular, small molecules that also participate, like ATP, for example, here. And uh, if you click on one of the reactions, you see this reaction is highlighted with yellow, there is a small description what is all this reaction about. So in this case, uh, I think it's a P53 is binding to the promoter of CDK, CDMA1A. So under each pathway, we have a, a text description of this pathway. And this is my favorite uh, feature. So we downloaded information from the human protein atlas. And uh, we have an expression of every protein that just participated in this pathway in the different human tissues. And you see in the case of P53, the expression is pretty even across all tissues. But uh, what is the second protein? CDN and 1A is, is, is kind of jumping up and down. So in the esophagus, there is a high expression. In heart, is a low expression. Don't ask me why, but you probably, as a biologist, can address these questions. And you can also download this information in different kind of formats. That's what reactome looks like. Very rich. A lot of work is invested in this project. It's for you, for biologists, for biochemists. Use it. So now I'm going to switch to the networks, pathways versus networks. So what is the difference? So this is the, how the pathway looks like. In this case, it's an EGFR pass signal. So EGFR receptor is interacting with its ligand. It's a complex, the blue color. Then it's dimerizing. And then uh, using, with the help of this kinase, it's getting phosphorylated. So it's a very nice view, human, easily human-readable. 
Uh, usually pathways are very detailed, as you see, there's a lot of information captured. So biochemical reactions are here. It's usually a very small scale, and uh, it's uh, concentrated information from the concentrated, uh, um, I don't know how to say, uh, from the literature. Networks are significantly more simplified. So you don't see those input and output like uh, in the pathways. All proteins have equal value. No small molecules here involved. So we remove them. Then uh, uh, when pathways are very small scale, the networks are large scale. We don't have an EGFR signaling networks. Networks are usually huge, and we, you can extract from the network the sub-network that is specific for your disease or specific for this particular pathway. Do you feel the difference? And if the uh, majority of the pathways are created by, based on the literature, the networks are created based on the literature and usually based on the omics data as well, using the machine learning uh, approaches. Um, that helps us to increase the, the genome coverage. So what, what kind of uh, network databases exist? So as I said, it's built automatically the curation, it's more extensive coverage of the human genome, and uh, here I put five or four examples of the different kind of popular networks that exist online. Uh, Biobreed, so don't get afraid by this number, it's not only human genomes, it's different kind of genomes. Intact means, and our favorite is the FI network, FI states from the functional interaction network that was built by, based on the reactor. So we have different kind of um, uh, versions, and the latest version contains about 11,000 proteins, which is uh, much bigger coverage than uh, just the reactor, and 880 interactions. And those um, network looks like this, and it's only 5% of the network. So we have a lot of these little nodes, which is a proteins, and those interactions between proteins. Some of the proteins are clustered together, like here, and some of them are just scattered around the network. So how the network analysis works? So what we're doing? Let's say this is our functional interaction network, and we have a number of genes that are upregulated, downregulated, and kind of a set. So, right, let's say, upregulated and downregulated. So we're projecting our genes into our networks. The next step, the, the, the plugin is looking for the interactions between those genes that are on our list. And the next step, uh, we might look for so-called linkers that is not on our list, but uh, that might help us to create a huge network built based on our genes and linkers together. And if we are removing the background network, that's what we are getting. And we can uh, retrieve a lot of useful information based on this network. So take your messages. There are three ways to analyze your data. It's a goal, pathway, and network-based analysis. Use all three. They're all different. They're all going to provide you different information. So let's talk about the enrichment analysis. It's basically those analysis that the test is running behind your password enrichment test. This can show to you so already from uh, Vincent presentation. So it's uh, output from the enrichment test, the list of the passwords. And what we do care here is the p-value and the adjusted p-value. So how are we getting those p-value? So enrichment test, for enrichment test, you need three different sets, three different items. It's basically the same. This is the same thing. What you need for the almost the same thing. What you need for the password analysis. It's your gene list, and one of the questions in Liverpool was whether my gene list should be normalized or not. I mean, enrichment analysis is not doing micro normalization, so everything should be done already before. So that's why I put here normalized gene list. The second one is basically your databases, Reactom, CAG, whatever. And the last one, it's very important, and I'll explain you why. It's a background list, all genes that were tested in your set. 
Then we have a black box, a big black box, enrichment test, and the output, enrichment table. The same what we saw in the previous slide. The list of the pathways, p-values, and any kind of adjustment, FDR, for example. So how uh, enrichment test works? It's usually done uh, by hypergeometrical test. So let's assume we have a bucket of 1,000 genes. It could be, for example, your shRNA screen, or, for example, in old days, the microarray contained not all genes in the human genome, only a particular set of genes, 1,000, yes. Or, for example, you created a panel of genes for target sequencing, which is very popular nowadays, 1,000 genes. Of those, 100 belongs to any kind of EGF path signaling pathway. You did your analysis, your sequencing, and you found out that five genes are significant. And of those three genes are belong to EGFR signaling pathway. Is it significant or not? Is your level five gene list enriched in EGFR signaling or not? So to test that, you have to generate the number of hypothesis and alternative hypothesis. It's always existing. So the new one, it's, there is no enrichment. Alternative is yes. My list is enriched in EGFR signaling. So to calculate this, you use this uh, very complicated formula, and uh, I don't think you will ever see it again. So just look at that and forget about it, yes? And here I put basically the values, that, the variables that are used in this formula. And the p-value is pretty significant. Yes? There are three very important points that I want to stop here. The first one, the background list, those 1,000 genes, is a part of this formula. It plays a very, very important role. So if you're not testing all genes, if you're not doing whole exome sequencing, if you're doing target sequencing, keep it in mind. You have to use number of genes that were tested in your essay. And uh, the um, highly sophisticated uh, pathway enrichment tools like G-Profiler is actually giving you the option to upload the gene list that was tested. The second point of view, uh, this part, uh, the second point of this part will be done automatically, so you don't really need to see it. And uh, the last one, as I said, if you have a hypothesis, in this case it's EGFR signaling, and you're doing only one enrichment test, this p-value is actually end point of your journey. But, as I said, in reactum we have almost 2,000 pathways, and if you want to test all 2,000 pathways, then this p-value is not the end of your journey, unfortunately. You should always keep, you should always think about the multiple test correction. So what would happen? So let's say we have the same bucket, we have the same 100 genes that belongs to your facility, and we randomly draw us five genes from this list. One, two, three, four, 100,000 times. So at that point of our life, we will withdraw all genes that are belongs to the HFR signaling. And the p-value will be very significant. Hooray, it works. But is it a true result? Is it what we want? I mean, that's what we want, but is it true? So, um, probably not. That's why if you're testing across a lot of pathways, you have to use FDR, Bonferroni correction, Q-score, adjusted p-value, or whatever, whatever your, your pathway enrichment test is providing, yes? They all do the same job. They're all slightly different. Some of them stricter, some of them less stricter. It doesn't matter. They all basically do the same job. So my favorite is for the FDR. It's a false discovery rate. And what is what it gives you is expected proportion of the absorbed enrichment due to random chance. I'll try to explain what does it mean. Let's say you run your test, you did a correction, and you choose the pathways that are with FDR less than 25%. Let's say 20 pathways were significant. Of those five are due to random chance. If you choose 
10% significance. Of course, there are less pathways that are significant, yes? Let's say there are only 10 are significant. Of those, only one due to random chance. And nine are good. And so the street we go, the better it is. So in the case of the 5%, let's say 5% are significant. Of those, only 0.25 are due to random chance. So what threshold to use? It's up to you. But I really hate the publications that using something like 25% FDR. It's, it's, not, it's not very good. So what I also want to mention here, sorry, a uh, hypertrometrical test, alone. it's a very, very, very useful test. And if you Google hypertrometrical test calculator, you can find a number of those online. So in this case, I just put those numbers that we used in our previous exercise, with interface signaling, and we basically got the p-value that I provided in my slide. Yes. So it's not only about pathways, it's not only about the goal terms. You can use it in your life, in your research, in your science, basically daily. Like, uh, for example, for example, 1,000 people are attending CCR conference, so those 200 people are PhD students. 50 people attending this workshop. Of those, 25 are PhD students. Can you consider PhD students as our audience for this workshop? If you calculate, if you're putting these four numbers in this um, online tool, you will calculate the people and can all know the answer. Got it? Okay, now let's, let's have fun. Okay, take message, sorry. Let's wait for fun. So, uh, hypergeometrical test is a very powerful statistical tool, use it. Don't forget small type of test correction, FDR, and keep in mind capital N, the, the size of your population, the size of your genes that you submitted for testing. The last one, I promised you to show one of the examples of the large-scale cancer genomics data analysis. So this is the um, whole zone sequencing of the 52 pancreatic cancers. Uh, more than 200 genes were recurrent. The first gene is a KRAS, and it was mutated in like 95% of samples. The second one is P53, it was mutated in about 50% of samples. And there is another, is one of those um, sodium channels that I really don't know anything about. But the rest of the genes mutated at a very, very low level, like 6%, 5%, and then the tail is getting small and small and small. So what are we going to do? What are we doing with that? So basically, we can collect those genes and run the pathway analysis. There is no problem about that. So here we created a so-called pipeline, how to analyze this kind of data. So you're generating your list of genes, you run your enrichment analysis using G profile, ICGC, Reactome, G tools, there are a number of tools available online. So you can browse significant pathways in Reactome, trying to make sense out of what you see. You can build broad interaction subnetwork, the way I showed you before. You can run clustering algorithm. Uh, I'll show you the output of that. And you can run enrichment analysis of each cluster, on each module individually. Drill down to understand molecular mechanism, validate your lab, validate your model usually in the wet lab and submit manuscript. And uh, all these um, uh, steps could be done using so called Reactome Function Interaction Network Cytoscape plugin. Who has ever used a Cytoscape before? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, five of the 50. Cytoscape is a framework. It's not a primary tool. It's a framework for creating different kinds of plugins. It's extremely useful for cancer genomics. So please, I mean, either you can attend one of our workshops or you can put your hands on by yourself, but it's highly recommended. And what, that's what we are getting out of Cytoscape. So we took all these genes that were mutated in those 52 exomes, pancreatic cancer exomes, uh, projected them into the functional reaction network, created so-called pancreatic cancer subnetwork, and run clustering. And then we annotated each cluster separately. Like, for example, here, it's a cluster of the genes, and this 
cluster of modules, basically the same thing, is enriched in the P53 signal. The size of the node, uh, the size of the node is proportional to the number of samples where this um, genes was found mutated. But P53 here, you see, it's pretty huge. But the rest of the genes, are, the, the the rest of the nodes are pretty small. Or let's say raw GTPase signaling here, the blue cluster, and so on. So, the last takeaway message, try different tools. Um, yes, issue of the non-relevant enrichment pathways. So, reactome is not only cancer research, yes, it's trying to cover many, many, many aspects of the human life. So, if you're, for example, analyzing your cancer cell lines and treating the drug or something like that, and you're using, and you see that the tuberculosis is enriched, Password, or any kind of HPV infection. I mean, don't publish it. It's not relevant password. So, in ideal world, before you are doing the enrichment analysis, you have to download all passwords from the reactor, go through them, and only choose those that are relevant to your study, and then run the enrichment. But it's a very laborious process. So it's much easier to parse your output than the input, yeah? And uh, if no significant passwords were detected and you excluded all possible mistakes, please don't get disappointed. Maybe your password, password hasn't been curated yet. Think about it. Maybe it's something new that you discovered, yes? And please, all lectures on password network analysis we can find on this bioinformatics.ca. You can download it, put it on your iPhone, you know, when you are on a bus, going to work, just listen, look, study, use it, please. And if you have questions, email us. That's it.